I injured my hand a few days ago, somewhere in around uh, here. Well, you know, you know where a hand is. Anyways, when you injure something, you have to move differently. You have to use things differently, whether that's holding things or, you know, a lot of time opening jars and that sort of thing. And you use different parts of your arm. And I thought I was very clever in doing the forearm hold, the forearm elbow hold. I thought it was very clever until, of course, I got a bunch of shooting pains down into my fingers. Happened to be kind of the exact course of the ulnar and medium nerves. Reminds me of another time when I first started doing this whole hands-on work thing, this manual therapy thing. The patient, you know, they would be laying on their side and it would often rest their knee on the side of my hip. Bent knees, and this is just a, a real good leverage point off when you're working on the back. And you can use a hold on the foot here to start spinning those legs around, twisting, rotating, you know, flexing, extending if you want to as well. And it gets really good control on that low back, on that hip, on that pelvis. And you think you're really, really clever, of course, until you get a bunch of shooting pains down the exact course of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which is this yellow one drawn right here. And you learn your lesson, of course. It's funny, this is something I kind of struggle with, because we have no problem with saying that there's an immediate issue, a nerve entrapment or impingement issue when it comes to hard forces suddenly sustained or sustained for a long period of time doing damage to a nerve. But what we can't really get just yet is the idea of mechanical pressures distorting nerve function. And I think some of the answer is actually within what we understand as the nerve and the nerve cell itself. What you got to understand is this, this nerve cell, you know, whether we're talking about the dendrites or the actual cell body or the axon all the way down in the hillock and, the, and as we get into the terminal area, what you have to understand is that it is a cell still. It's, it's not that much different than many other cells, in, in some ways at least. There's going to be fluid inside all of this, this cell body, the organelles, have to float as usual. And this fluid should actually extend the whole way down, all the way down to the terminals, and it should go through the dendrites as well. It, sh it shouldn't be any different. One of the reasonings for this is that we have to have somewhere for that sodium and potassium to go. If you know anything about the nerves, you've probably, ah, too many times, had to learn about sodium potassium pumps. We all did it at one point or another. And, and just understand that the sodium potassium is floating in some kind of fluid outside this nerve cell to begin with. This is normal. But to get it effectively in and out, we have to have somewhere to move it to. So if you're looking at if you're looking at the inside of this axle on this nerve tube, if you will, there has to be something in here because that sodium, you're pumping it in, has to actually go in. It doesn't just adhere to the wall of the cells. That's your sodium. And the potassium, to get that out, it doesn't just, it's not stuck to anything. It's kind of free-floating. It moves by electrical potential, of course. That's kind of the neater thing about all of this. The nerve is not the wire we think it is a lot of times. It's an analogy, and the analogy kind of makes sense in a way, but it's not that accurate. It doesn't transport electrons. The sodium and potassium is not an electron transport system. So that impulse coming in, it's really doing this the whole way around, it will change the potential which causes that switch to flip, which you know brings in the sodium, brings up the potassium, and by changing that potential, the next switch, sodium potassium pump, flips also, causing the next one and the next one is kind of just jumping this whole way down, all the way down until we finally get to the distal ending. And you know, then there's the calcium influx and all that, and then there's the neurotransmitter release. You get that part. But it's not just the wire, the wire doesn't give it enough credit. So there's got to be a, a fluid component to all this, to move this stuff. Now what's getting to be a, a, a both very interesting and a understood example is 
a certain neurotransmitter called serotonin, there's a little s there for it, that's traveling up the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, depending on how you look at it, you could say it's going to or coming from, it's, it's really doing both, but it's, let's say it's coming from the cranium, it's going through the thorax, STA, hitches a ride with the esophagus, goes to the respiratory diaphragm, and eventually gets to all of the intestinal stuff, all the, all the gut. And this serotonin molecule, the serotonin neurotransmitter, is produced down here, and it goes all the way up. This is like a, just a ridiculous idea. It goes up this nerve to get to the cranium, and it actually helps to influence mood in the brain, in the central nervous system. That's it. That's a huge difference, you know. You know, unless something is being produced in the toe, you know, I, I don't think there's that much that goes goes that much farther. But it's actually not that uncommon. This is getting to be better understood, getting kind of popular. But there is such a thing, and it's been known for you know just a longer period of time. In fact, called axoplasmic transport. And usually it's going. You know, we could say it's going the other way. And we'll just call it ax ax. Trans, you get the idea. Axoplasmic transport, and it's it's simply the same thing happening, really quite regularly, all over the body. So let's say, for instance, you've got a central nervous system. There's your spinal cord in the cervical spine here, and what will happen is, in most places, you'll have some kind of a product produced at the cell bodies, which again would be spinal, central nervous system, make that a slightly better red, and it will go down, and let's say it hitches a ride on the axillary nerve, and it gets sent out to whatever happens to be in that region. It actually has a, a you could say, neutrifying effect or a supplying effect, a stimulating effect to whatever is in that region, whether that might be, you know, the deltoid muscle, it could be the skin over the area, it could be joint tissues, it could be glands as well. There's going to be some kind of a supplying protein structure that's coming through that nerve that actually gets sent along that pathway. And this is really interesting, and, and it does shed a bit of light on how mechanical pressures could actually influence the function of the tissues and not just pain sensation there's there's a really reasonable relationship with all this you know if you look at it, it it's everywhere in the body if this were true and we can't prove it but if this were true it'd be a big deal you understand that there's the bone which is the gray thing here and then the nerve of course in orange and then the muscle and we can throw in a fascia layer too because typically the fascia surrounds all these things the fascia is you know, integral to all this. But when we start to twist this up, we start to put like any kind of a spin, a compression, or torsion, we're going to change the pressure relationship between these two things. The bone's not going anywhere. It's very easy for the muscle to press into that nerve. And though that's not immediately fatal by any means, you know, it's not going to totally disrupt it, but it can change the pressure dynamic in that fluid component of the nerve, not necessarily affecting the electrical immediately, but it could affect the fluid component, and that would cause a back pressure in the system, making it harder to transport some of this axoplasmic transport substances. Let's take, uh, let's take that shoulder for a, a, just a bigger example. We've got a lot of stuff covering these nerves. So in here, we've got like the radial nerve, uh, which is your your one that's going behind going behind the humerus here and then we've got an ulnar and a median and just to understand they're totally covered by muscles the whole way through i'm going to draw them in blue you know just because clarity sick so there's the posterior ones this would be in behind but we have rotator cuff muscles for instance we have the deltoid which was mentioned already which is give or take right here we have of course the biceps which is a, a relatively large one that covers up a lot of these and the triceps in the back and then even even larger still we could throw in the trapezius oh not trapezius hey come on pec major muscles i know anatomy pec major muscle that covers all this up and they're the fact that they can be over top doesn't mean they're immediately putting pressure on it but it doesn't mean they can exert pressure especially with lots of different positions and contractions and especially excessive contractions and pulls now, it's not built without, you know, some security. Do understand that any of these nerves 
will have some kind of a fascial reinforcing layer. They will have a connective tissue layer covering them. And often in the larger bundles, they will have a certain amount of fat around them. But it doesn't mean it's perfect. You could argue that, hey, well, it's got this built-in protection. Should be an issue. And that's fine. The fact that there is protection actually shows that it's trying to avoid excessive mechanical pressure. But it doesn't mean it works in all situations. Now this goes even a little bit further, even even a little bit further. I'm just gonna just get rid of that layer just to just to clear a few things up. Understand that if it works on the somatic nerves, the ones going to the skeletal muscles, the same theory could be applied to many of the organs. So there's like a liver and a spleen, and there's a large intestine. So the liver and spleen get a celiac supply. I'm just going to get rid of that for clarity. And so this celiac supply, in, in just a really simple way, it's hitching a ride with the aorta behind it. So the aorta would be like here, and their nerves extending from the spine. But really easy. They go from back to front, back to more in the front. So they have to go in behind. Same thing with the large intestine. And it gets inferior mesenteric, and largely it's going from the back to more towards the front, all throughout. It's complex, but I mean, we can simplify this relatively well. And so, consider for a second how encased the viscera are, these organs are. Look at all the muscles around them. You know, we've got bone and back, muscles on the sides. And then pick your, pick your muscle, you know, rectus abdominis, sure thing. You want the obliques? Absolutely. The muscle that actually quite literally tenses things up, that's its whole job. The transverse abdominis. Many of these things could put pressure on them. And if the fluid delivery, if the fluid transference of these nerves was important, this has the potential to change the pressure and change the flow. So this is a theory for sure. It's a theory. But consider for a sec what effect constant unyielding pressure would have on these nerves, what effect this would have on our whole nervous system, and what it could do over time to affect the body. Just a thought anyways.